Hello and welcome to week 2 of lectures. This week we will cover more details of the linear model and we will cover a lot more of R as well. So we'll see how we go with this one. Let's start. So this week we're looking at the linear stats model continued. So this is the outline. We'll look at multiple linear regression now. We'll look last week at simple linear regression which means there was only one explanatory or its variable. Then we'll extend the linear model to also include categorical variables. We'll then learn about transforming variables and why we should transform. And finally, we'll look at directions. In the face-to-face -face lecture session, we'll take a look at more examples and also extend some of the work here. So let's start on the multiple linear regression model. Here's an example. We've got an example on what's called beef data, price of beef. So here we've got the year the PB, which is price of beef in cents per pound, this is British data, and the consumption of beef per capita, and all the other variables as well, you can look at them yourself. So, what we're going to do, well, what we can do is take a look at a regression of the price of beef on all the other variables here. PBE, the price of beef here, is the response variable, the others are all explanatory variables. And the idea is to work out what uh, which variables affect the price of beef. So here is the model. PBE is beta naught, which is the intercept term. Previously we had only one explanatory variable, now we've got all of these here. So beta 1 is the coefficient for CBE, and so on and so forth. And finally, of course, we also have the error term here. Okay. Here's the model. So first I read the data, and we've got beef here, a read table. So after we read the data, the syntax for the LM command is the same, except since we have more variables to add, we just separate them by plus signs. And then some of the beef you can see here. So we discussed previously the idea of significance in the model. So it's a matter of deciding whether any relationship we're seeing here does really exist, or is it just because we put the thing in the model, we get some coefficient out of it. And we judge it by looking at the p-values. So if you look at this, you know the intercept, because the intercept will always be in the model. I repeat, whenever you have any variables in the model, the intercept will remain as well. So here, this variable here, which is CBE, and this one here, which is CFO, are the only ones with p-values less than 0 0.05. So at the 5% significance level, those are the only significant variables. So based on the model so far, this is the model equation. Now, the question is, how do we select the best model? That is, how do we know what variables should stay in the model and what ones do we take out? Because we saw in the previous one that out of the five or six variables, only two are significant. How do we proceed from here? Well, what we do is we remove the non-significant variables, in other words, those variables with p-values bigger than 0 0.05 here, but one at a time. If you remove them all, you find things go wrong, because the thing is, there's a lot of problems with multiple regression, that removing or including one variable can change the significances of another variable. And of course, of course as you remove or add variables, the coefficients for the variables also change. And as the next item says, removing or adding a variable can sometimes make a variable that was previously significant into a variable that's now non-significant, and also the other way around here. So some experimentation may be required here, and you'll probably get some ideas as we go through as well, and we'll discuss some of these things as well. But generally speaking, this isn't quite so simple. We'll discuss some other strategies later in the lectures. So in this case, the p-values indicate that the only variables we saw earlier were significant, and these other four of, of them are not significant. So we should refit the model, omitting the non-significant variable with the largest p-value. And then we'll find some conventional change, and we'll decide what to do from there. So this is a step-by-step -step process. So here, what we've done is, we've used the update command, so previously, the model we had was saved in beef.lm and I'm saving the new object in beef.lm1 so this is the next one up and you can see, use the command update here there's my model object, there's a comma 
uh, dot a tilde uh, dot minus RFP. So that removes the variable RFP from the model. And you can see now, when I look at the summary, I've got all the variables are now significant in the model. So all of a sudden, by dropping just one variable, we find that the model has all variables now significant. And this is not very unusual, but it doesn't happen all the time. Usually you find dropping one variable means that maybe some other variables face significance, but it's not often you find that all the remaining variables become significant. So here's a surprise here. Now what we find is that the multiple R is almost unchanged if you compare them with the previous model. Nothing much different there. The adjusted R square has increased, and that's a good, a good thing to happen because the adjusted R square adjusts for the number of variables in the model. So the previous model had one extra variable, and the adjusted R square has one less variable. So the idea usually is we want a simpler model with fewer variables. And the simpler model is a better model for many reasons. One is it's easier to understand any structure that the model might actually be showing us. The second is, of course, it's easier to predict as well. And the third is, in some situations where we want to control the output, it's easier to control as well. And of course, if you find that if you add more variables to the model, regardless of whether they're significant or not, the R square won't decrease. It might stay the same, often it'll increase by a little bit, but it won't decrease. So, a better model can be uh, selected by all of these. You want a larger multiple R or R squared, you want just, just R squared that increases as well, and you want also a smaller standard error. We'll see some other ideas as we go through here. This was important because this actually measures the amount of misfit in the data, the residual standard error. Diagnostics, so we've put here the usual normal probability plots. You find that it's not too bad. There's some sort of departures from straight line here, which at the end over here as well. But nothing serious. Nothing too serious. Not no strong departures from the straight line. Histogram is also important to look at. Here's histogram of residuals, and you find that well, this is the residuals as they are. So it's, well, they are all lie between negative three and three, which isn't so bad. I've also plotted here the standardized residuals, and they all lie between negative 2 and 2. Now, the previous one might have looked a bit more normal than this one here. But the thing with histograms is they're very, very sensitive to the class boundaries. So, they change the class boundaries here, the histogram will change shape. So, the next one here, I've got fewer classes in the, in the histogram, only four. You can see it looks a bit more symmetric. There's some problem over here we can see, and that may be what we saw earlier also in the normal probability plot. But other than that, there's nothing serious here. So histogram is not too different from than expected from a normal distribution. If you actually simulate normal data, say a thousand points or something, this is actually quite a small data set here. And you look at the histogram that comes from data that you simulated as normal distribution, you'll find that there'll be all kinds of different shapes. So even from data that is from normal distribution, You'll find histograms having what we call cliffs, so it may be like this. And that's what all it is, there's a cliff at this end here. We might find all other, other kinds of shapes as well. You'll, you'll also find the gaps in the histogram, so it's not unusual to find these kinds of histograms from data that may actually come from normal distributions. So, we're looking here for strong departures from normality, that's the idea. Take a look at the residuals, standardized residuals against predicted value. We're looking to see if there are any patterns in, the day in this plot here, which may indicate to us that a linear model might be appropriate. There's nothing really serious here. You might find, well, maybe there's some change in spread over here, for example, but that may be just uh, a, a visual thing more than anything else. It may be just uh, because of, there's only a few points at this end over here. If I was to remove those points, or at least one of those points, you might find there's nothing particularly uh, to worry about in these points here as well. So we know from the normal probability plot there for some points that misbehave a little bit. So there's nothing serious here. You might be thinking there's some change in spread, but if you look at the overall residuals, they all lie between negative 1.5 and 1.5 or so. There are no really serious outliers here either. So I'd accept this as a, as a good model here. 
otherwise I wouldn't I wouldn't actually worry about any of the assumptions. So the usual assumptions that we test for are going to be normality, and, and then the linear model is appropriate, and any problems with non-homogeneous variance or heteroskedicity, those are all okay here. What about including categorical variables in the model? We'll cover that in the next lecture. Thank you. Bye.